Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please take your seats. The ceremony begins, re, continues, is the word I'm looking for, in like two seconds. Welcome back. I hope everybody had a good lunch. How about that weather out there? Pretty good, huh? Well, I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, so this is paradise for me, I got to tell you. So, as you might imagine. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce or reintroduce the Director, Office of Diversity Management and Equal Opportunity, Mr. Clarence A. Johnson. Sir? Okay, so we are in place. Uh, we have had a terrific lunch. And uh, I think that, uh, Mr. Griffith, uh, my presentation and yours are the one between these folks and the in their rearview mirrors. Uh, so we will get on with it. Uh, I'm on the schedule to talk about the future of DNI within the services. Um, and what I'll do during this presentation is uh, I'm going to reiterate some of the things that have been stated already with the panels, with the discussions, because I'm going to take you on what I call DOD's continuing diversity and inclusion journey. Because I indeed see this as we progress a journey. And I will submit to you that from its inception, our nation's military has been an organization where people of all backgrounds and walks of life have served in the defense of our nation. And truly, that's whether or not they operated in an environment of equity, dignity, and respect or not. But I'm happy to report that over time, on this journey, we're at a point of standing together on battlefields around the world as we work together, both military and civilian workers, continuing to demonstrate the value of diversity and inclusion to the strength of the total force of your Defense Department. So there admittedly has been an evolution on this journey. And I will submit to you that this evolution really has been prompted by the desire for military necessity. Because we need to ensure our military indeed becomes and is the strongest war fighting force in the world. So from the Buffalo Soldiers to the Navajo Code Talkers to the Barankineers and beyond, Diverse groups of Americans have come together to serve our country and uphold our nation's founding principles of liberty and justice for all. And you know we are a nation of collaboration, one of innovation, and one of progress. And I will submit to you that the Defense Department has arguably led the nation in the progression of equality and advancement of diversity. Some almost 70 years ago this day, President Truman signed and issued Executive Order 9981 effectively integrating the military forces. And some folks don't know that on that same day, he signed Executive Order 9980 that also called for equity and fairness in federal civil service. Roll the clock forward on this journey a few years to the 1990, and there was a law established called the American with Disabilities Act. Roll the clock even further forward, and more particularly affecting DOD, other barriers to equality crumbled when we opened all occupations to women, and of course, allowed our LGBT military members to serve openly. So over the years, the department has conducted programs initiatives and policies I will submit, as I said yesterday, toward a more perfect union. Now, I happen to hold the belief that diversity is a cornerstone of DOD's total force. I really believe that a high-quality force has made our military strong, but a high-quality diverse force 
has made our military stronger. And I will tell you that all the secretaries of defense I've served with have can articulate it, the fact that diversity is the strength of our military. In fact, Secretary of Defense Matters said, and I quote, in our nation's history, our military has often served as an example to the American people of unity and strength, of how a diverse group of people can be motivated, even under austere or grim conditions on the battlefield, to come together as equals, end of quote. So on this journey, keeping alignment with the Secretary's of defense over the years, priorities, and in fact, the matter of diversity being important to them. This Department of Defense has engaged on a, on a number of initiatives. I'm talking about the entire department. I'm just going to just highlight a couple of them, some of which have been talked about already. But I remember very clearly in 2014 when we got the most recent version of the DOD Human Goals Charter signed. To have been in our term that day, when the Secretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Service Secretaries, the Chiefs of Staff of the Services, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Director of Washington Headquarters and Management at the Pentagon, when all of them signed, broadcast to the world, the Human Goals Charter. The Human Goals Charter, I hope, is posted in your workplaces throughout the military because that was and continues to be to in, the intent of that. It is the cornerstone. It is the cornerstone of the department's equality and inclusion programs. And in fact, my office right now is working to provide an, an updated version of the Human Goals Charter because DOD policy stipulates that each Secretary of Defense signs a Human Goals Charter. So we're working on it right now. Next, I uh, alluded earlier to opening all combat occupations to women. That was a huge undertaking. It was pushed and, 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 uh, by the Congress, of course, and the services participated. But related to that, the services have been working for some time and, and it's catching, I'm not sure exactly how much this is throughout the services, but I know it's with the Air Force and I think with the Navy, and that is the Career Under Mission Program which many of you may have got talked about in the panel today. I kind of missed some of the panel discussion, but that was a program that was instituted because, of course, the services looked at retention, the retention of women in the services. And it's obviously noted that that which women bring to the, to the fight indeed is, is critical. So that career and mission program was put in place. And of course, related to that was the 12 weeks of non-chargeable maternity leave for women also. So those are the kinds of programs that, one, one, one example of programs that also advance diverse inclusion. I will submit to you that when I got in this position in 2003, now services may correct me on this, but I don't remember that there was one senior diversity council, not a one. Uh, DOD policy at that time, 1350.2, called for something called the Defense Equal Opportunity Council. The DOC had not met since March of 2000. So when I got there in 2000, as a colonel in 2003, yes, in this job, there was not one defense senior level diversity council. But today, all the services have senior level diversity councils. All the services have bodies where the senior leaders in the military services, in fact, review and assess diversity progress and take actions and initiatives to, to make a difference. Associated with that is, by requirement, the services brief their, their leaders semi-annually on certain aspects of diversity progress within their service. And I want to commend in this audience the National Guard Bureau, uh, Joe Lingiel, Joe Salas. Uh, I've attended a couple of their joint diversity executive councils and a, a body that works across the states and territories, and you'd be impressed at the progress that the Guard has made in this regard with their JDEC construct. So thank you very much for, for the Guard for doing that. And at the, uh, the um, uh, two-star level uh, in the department, in about 2008, 2009, we stood up a body that still exists called the Defense Diversity Working Group. 
And that is a body at the two-star level, again, as I said, which is designed to come together, to push initiatives, to share best practices. In fact, one of the key working groups under that DDWG is a metrics sub-working group, which again comes together to put metrics behind some of these things we're putting in place. And this was, of course, charged by the MLDC to do certain things with metrics and watching the recommendation up from that body. A different issue, the, the department in 2008 convened a STEM diversity summit, a science, technology, engineering, and math diversity summit, because we recognize that those with STEM experiences and backgrounds, uh, both in civilian workforce and military workforce, are critical to DOD. So we convened a two-day summit. From this summit came a recommendation that the department needs to stand up a STEM diversity campaign in my office and the services, work together with our technology and logistics folks, and put together a national STEM diversity campaign that exists to this day. Because we recognize, the services recognize, that the market is the market is the market. And the market out there for the demographics, demographics are shifting. It behooves us to make sure we plow each market to get the very best talent that's in the particular market. In fact, as I look at some other things the department is doing, working with the services of my office, uh, we uh, about a year or so ago launched a research study. You know, anecdotally over the years, and we've totally healed this, and we've been standing by it, and there's some research to kind of, well, not research, but we're trying to get the research done. And that is the matter of why certain minorities don't choose combat arms, don't choose tactical operations, don't choose those careers where most of our senior leaders come from. What's up with that? Why most folks that the Air Force hires, for instance, uh, that uh, come in to fly airplanes are now minorities. You know, I remember when I was an aviator, I was a navigator back in the, in the 70s. And I don't remember the data precisely, but I would guess that aviators, navigators, and, and pilots back in that day was about 7% of the, of the Air Force's aviation force. Now, navigators are kind of going away, so the numbers are kind of tricky. But a decade later, excuse me, a generation later, my son, who just retired as an Air Force pilot, 2% uh, of Air Force pilots were black. So not just in the Army and the Marine Corps where the study is ongoing, but throughout the military services, minorities somehow don't tend to, to select the tactical ops fields, career fields, those fields that most of general officers in the particular services come from. So we have a study of the Army and Marine Corps to take a look at that, to try to put some recommendations and maybe some policies behind it. Additionally, commanders are required by law and indeed by policy uh, to conduct organizational climate surveys with the idea of assessing the organizational climate, mitigating some of those behaviors that are detrimental to readiness and detrimental to diversity and inclusion. And from those assessments, taking a look at how they can formulate action plans to mitigate some of those behaviors. And you heard the services speak quite eloquently over the last panel regarding some of the things that they're doing. Uh, let me foot stop a couple of them. I was impressed when I read I think uh, Colonel Jones mentioned the fact that the Air Force is now looking at some of those initiatives that were put out in the 15 and 16 time frame. But I will tell you that uh, the department, we've been trying to move the department in the area of some of the initiatives the Air Force has indeed taken. One of which I remember, I think it's still a, uh, an initiative, and that is the Air Force put forth an initiative to that for their applicants applying to their accession sources, that some 30% of them would be women. Uh, that's huge. Those who apply, you obviously got to have an applicant pool to select from. But let's say you got to select 30% women. It says, so if your applicant pool is not 30% women, it says whatever percent of women, what kind of actions are you taking to, to increase that pool? Again, the market is a market is a market. All the services have different levels of engagement with affinity groups. Now, the affinity groups are those folks who are out there in the hinterland that advocate on behalf of diversity, be it from disability demographics or race ethnic demographics or gender demographics, 
Uh, there are different kinds of national organizations who have very close connection with some of the recruiter market. And as Title V says for our, for our, our civilians, that you will recruit from all segments of the society. So how to identify, you know, rather than continuing to go into MIT for some of our folks who work in labs, there are also, you know, special people at HBCUs and, and, and Hispanic serving institutions that can be looked at. But if you don't go to those schools, then of course how are you going to make sure you're in fact tackling all the market? But the engagement with affinity groups is one that has been useful to us, and we continue to work in that regard in a diversity outreach arena. Conducting training to avert unconscious bias and improve employee engagement is something that, uh, that the services have all doing at, doing at some level or, or the other. That's also been helpful on the diversity journey, I think. Requiring some aspect of diversity on selection panels and slates for key positions, for selection of key positions. That's also been, I think, something that's helpful in the diversity, in the diversity journey. And the journey continues. To prepare to construct a framework to provide annual briefings, annual briefings, annual training, if you will, uh, whether, whether it's annual training, excuse me, annual briefing, annual training to our practitioners and to our leaders that also is a critical need that we, that we continue to work. Getting diversity and inclusion training to not just practitioners on the ground, but to leadership at some periodic basis is a critical, critical part of this diversity and inclusion strategy. So we are working with Naomi. We have recently directed a project. Uh, in addition to working with Naomi, we have additionally, we, we, uh, directed a project to look into some of the analytical and qualitative assessments of the current DNI state within the department and to outline some specific actions that ODME and the service can take to increase diversity and inclusion within the OD. And part of this requirements that we're directing, part of the analytical stuff we're doing, really is to prepare us to brief the Defense Human Resources Board. We are on tap this spring, I think I mentioned this yesterday, to brief the, the DHRB on those kind of things that we can do to, to ensure the leadership is aware of the progress of DOD from a training aspect, from an infrastructure aspect, and from other aspects uh, going forward. Specifically, areas for that DNI look is going to include uh, how we're doing in updating our plans and instructions, uh, how we're doing on training the general workforce and the practitioners, assessing the command assignment process, assessing offender group alignment, how are the offender groups helping us to achieve mission success, how are they living up to support, lining up to support us. I think that it's critical that we align key stakeholder groups to mission achievement, and last, more use of predictive analysis to provide leadership a summary of environmental product, problematic behaviors. So I would think that the future of DNI calls for more data and enhanced analytics, both qualitative analytics and, and, and quantitative uh, uh, analytics. We have been very, very good at collecting quantitative data and reporting that we've been not as good as collecting qualitative data. Qualitative data tends to maybe lean us toward how our employers military members engaged in their mission. So this study that we're working now that we'll be briefing DHRB on also includes some qualitative data as well. So we believe that if we are going to impact climate and culture, we must keep digging. We are getting sharper around, again, qualitative data as we work this. And I think that's important because getting predictive kinds of pieces involved, predict predictive kinds of analysis done, I think is helpful to our mission. For example, in, in order to, to look further into female separations, uh, further study we think is required. Now, progress has been, has been made uh, with some services experiencing a, a decrease in the female separations, but there is room for, for improvement. Uh, females are doing well in the pipeline, but, but barriers to high level of promotions to continue to exist throughout the military. Yeah, if we look at a recent assessment of, of command assignments, there indicates a need for a study in more detail. 
You know, through the assessment we've conducted already of the current state within DNI, our team conducted a preliminary review of top level positions and tracked the careers of our most recent military leaders in, who hold the chief of staff for equivalent positions. And during this review, we looked at the type of assignments they achieved during their careers to see exactly what helped them to get to where they were or lack of assignments that didn't, that mitigated them not going there. We found that across the department, racial and ethnic minorities are selected for command assignments at below board average rates. We need further assessment to allow an understanding of those key assignments that most senior leaders must have to advance to the higher level. So we need to dig deeper into the data to determine the quality of assignments and look closer at why ethnic and racial minorities are less likely to be selected for command assignments than others. We also need to take a close look at the criteria for command assignment selection. Uh, we, we require further study and analysis to determine if racial and ethnic minorities have been overlooked despite having qualifications to serve in these, these positions. And when it comes to promotions, as we know, being in the zone means you are on target. Below the zone means promotion earlier than average, and above the zone, of course, indicates promotion later than average. And those who are promoted above the zone, generally, uh, that's their last chance of promotion. But except for the Army, most African Americans, black promotions occur above the zone. The data shows that minority Americans' career development is slowing, and most services, there's a weakness in the progress of, again, some, many, some minorities. To, so to see improvement, we need to push toward more data collection, more research, and create more, more policy. And we look at DEOX results, for example, minorities experience discrimination based on race ethnicity, looking at DEOX, higher than the majority. And when we look at some of our OPA done surveys, the workplace equal opportunity surveys, for example, both for both active and reserve component members, the outcomes for minorities generally are not as positive as those for, for the majority. Obviously, we must work to ensure that appropriate pathways exist for individuals to be productive and effective as they can be. This includes reducing barriers to success in an individual career advancement as well as barriers while that prevent diversity and inclusion across the total force. Of course, the idea we continue to work to ensure that the department, we are accurately enhancing the ability of all total force members to be, the coin army phrase, the best they can be. And I alluded to training earlier, and got kind of hung up actually, but because training is important, as we continue to diversify the force, it is important, again, that training not only goes to our senior leaders, but also to our practitioners. And again, we're working with Diomi to enhance the training for our practitioners. We also work with the to enhance the training of our senior leaders because we think, we think, that's, we think that's important. We have asked the OMA to take a look at the services needs, uh, particularly as we abide by our most recent harassment DOTI, direct DOD uh, instruction, to figure out exactly who are those who need to be trained and what skill sets do they need to have. So the OMA is putting together a plan to make sure that comes to, come to fruition in the not too distant future. We also, uh, for the total force training, now, you know, DOD policy, the Harrison DOD says that the Army is supposed to be reviewing the services training plans. That's a huge undertaking for the Army, quite honestly. And we're trying to figure out how to do that because the services, of course, all have training plans, but the new DOD says for the harassment piece at least, the Army is to review that training plan. So we're working through that. However, for the services to include to build training plans, we're trying to you know, give some help if we can. Uh, recently, we partnered with a, I think Rock mentioned this a little bit today in the panel discussion. Uh, we partnered with uh, a firm called Diversity and Inclusion TV to pilot a training program that would go across the services. It was a very uh, inexpensive uh, uh, effort. In fact, uh, it, it, is, it produces uh, DOD-centric online diverse and inclusion shows featuring an SES leader series, and the topics pretty much covered, the main topics, topics covered unconscious bias and the new inclusion quotient, the new IQ. Uh, anybody familiar with new IQ, raise your hand. Okay, not everybody is. 
Uh, how about uh, any game changers in the room? Okay. So you ask, what are game changers? Well, the Office of Personnel Management, uh, which uh, uh, runs the Federal em Employment View Viewpoint Survey, the FEVS. Um, that survey is administered to the civilian workforce, uh, I think, every year. And uh, they have, w over time and with a little research, have determined that there are questions they can, p can look into further to figure out how services are, how the agencies, rather, are conducting themselves so that employees feel more and more engaged. Uh, and they came up with this IQ and the, this new inclusion quotient based on those questions. And this training kind of gets leaders and, and, and others to exactly what this is about. Uh, again, it's about increasing employee engagement. And what we found from the pilot that was recently run, that more than 80% of the pilot training participants thought the modules gave them new information which could be applied to their work. Nearly 80% thought the modules gave them tools and techniques to improve as a leader. And 100% of the SES level leaders participated throughout the sessions, offered them, said they, it offered them good tools and tips to improve as leaders themselves. Again, the journey continues. And so at, on this journey, we have made and will continue to make progress, but quoting a favorite poet, miles to go before we sleep. In that regard, I would submit that our ongoing and future efforts on this journey likely falls into three buckets. And I hope I'd leave you with these three buckets. The folks kind of remember things in threes. So I'm going to leave it three like ABCs, you know, Ren 1010, uh, Crap Snackle. There you go. Okay. 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 Uh, let, me, let me give you my threes I want to leave you with. Uh, first of all, you know, one of the research scientists I've been working with over the years said, you know, CJ, uh, it's good to plan. Uh, but do something. So not m less, m less planning, more do. Well, okay, I understand that, but you gotta have a plan to start with. And of course, we have a DOD, Diversity Inclusion uh, Plan, I think you've alluded to today. Uh, in fact, uh, Victoria Bowens, when she was in my office, uh, was one who was principal behind putting that out. But you know, in studying, planning, I think number one, we need to have a solid strategic plan, not just the DOD level, at the component level as well. And in all the plans I've looked at, OPM recently released, last year released one, other agencies that released them, I looked at a bunch of them, and here's what the plans pretty much have across the board. You need some goals, obviously, or some objectives, or some parts. Uh, one key part of any plan has got to be leader accountability and commitment. That's got to be the number one. If, if you're looking to sustaining, sustain anything, uh, you can have a plan that has an objective that shows how the leader not only talks to talk, but walks to walk. And the three buckets I'm giving you now, they're all interrelated. Let me say it first, they're all interrelated. But strategic planning is, is I think, key. And in fact, leader accountability should be a piece of it. I think that outreach needs to be a piece of it. You know, if we, if we believe we keep fishing in the same pond and we indeed want to make our workforce somewhat reflected from a demographic, gender, disability, uh, uh, proportion relative to our, 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 where we come from, uh, then we got to fish in a, in a wide variety of ponds. As I stated earlier, from the civilian workforce, you know, Tower 5 says recruit from all, all segments of society. So we got to be out there recruiting, intentionally looking for all segments of society. That's how I define outreach. If, in, I mean, for instance, you know, I look at some data some years ago. And uh, in fact, the congressman called my office um, from Georgia about three years ago. He said, you know, I, I just didn't know why. Uh, why uh, blacks don't become generals faster? I said, well, sir, that's a huge, huge, huge question. I said, uh, it's, 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 there's a lot of things go into that. He said, well, like what? I said, well, you know, one thing that we, we know anecdotally is, you know, uh, 
Uh, the black officers that come into the army, for instance, uh, most of them, this is, this is, this is, most of them don't occupy the, now, don't occupy the top grades that the generals are in. We've had several studies that, research studies that show that, that uh, of the, some 75% of those careers that lead to the top grades, minorities and women were not in those careers in big numbers. Well, why not? The congressman's office asked. I said, well, you know, their branching decisions happen to do, it. he goes, why can't you just make blacks be combat arms? Let me get this right, Congress. Let me get this right now. So you want DOD to require black officers to join ROTC, come to the academy. When they get ready to get out, they must go into combat arms. Yep. And I tell you what, help us out. Why don't you go to your state and you call all the black folks together and say, uh, we're going to put all your boys and girls of African American descent into the military and they're going to come back on. Try that one. When you do that, we'll, we'll follow you. Uh, um, you're not going to convince any, for any group, blacks, Hispanics, white, you just wouldn't do that. There are a number of things that transpire. But I submit this if we, in fact, if I'm talking black numbers, if we, in fact, are recruiting blacks, are graduating from college at a 9% rate, and we're recruiting 9% of, of, of um, uh, accessions, ROTC in the cabinet is black. And we don't, 30 years from now, don't have a projection for having some cohort of folks going to general. Maybe we do need to figure out how to go different places and recruit folks. If same thing for women, same thing for Hispanics, same thing for any, you pick a demographic. But the point is, we have to have an outreach strategy. Part of our plan has got to be, be key, and leader commitment got to assist that. In reach. This is a term I learned, in fact, I think Ken Barrett, who was a yes that coined this term in the Navy. In reach. What's in reach? I will submit to you as a guy who is the lead EEO, lead discrimination policy guy for DOD. I watched reports from the services on the civilian side. I watched reports from the service on the military side. And I'm convinced that we do have some outliers out there, a few folks who participate in discriminatory activity, but that's, that's, not, that's not much. That's not a reason for for uh, folks not being promoted. I don't think we've disc there's discrimination writ large that calls women and calls minorities don't uh, to get command assignments. I think there's more to it than that. In reach is what this is about. In reach is what types of data are we looking at to in fact see what's going on with career development. I asked, for example, my colleagues in HR two years ago, uh, for your leader development programs, let me see the data on on who gets selected, who apply first of all, who gets selected to your lead development program, 13, 14 level. And not very much diversity to even, even apply. Now, that ain't nothing to do with the services, folks don't, but why is that? Why, why is it that we don't get diversity in those who even apply? And we got diversity in the, in the pipeline. If you look at the numbers of minorities in the 13, 14 level, there's a huge number of them. But when you look at those who attend the leader development program, why don't they get, they even apply? I think the Air Force is on to something. That 30% African pool goal for women joining the service academy, I mean the uh, accession sources, maybe they, to, maybe they ought to apply to career development. Maybe 30% of GS 12, 13s who are going to apply for a leader development program, maybe they ought to be, have some African pool goal for diversity. In reach, in reach means developing your own. So strategic plan first with three goals, leader commitment and accountability, in reach and outreach. Second, infrastructure. Now, you know, um, when Mr. Barry was talking the other day and he talked about how he uh, had Admiral Harvey's and Admiral Mullins and, and other admirals behind him, in putting together a plan for the Navy back in the day, uh, he was able somehow to convince them to, to grow the resources to accomplish the mission. When I look around the services, particularly as we get into stemming these problematic behaviors that the Congress is on us about making sure we take care of, uh, the services have different ways based on service uniqueness, I understand that, but we gotta figure out an infrastructure such that as we put a strategy together, that we have an infrastructure to support the strategy. I will submit to you that, that mitigating behaviors like hazing, bullying, 
harassment, discrimination, is equally as important to diversity and inclusion as is recruiting. I would characterize that maybe as part of your inreach, certainly part of your inclusion, uh, but how we guard against those behaviors on the ground has to come from the infrastructure, policy infrastructure at the top. And I recognize there are resource constraints, uh, both at the headquarters level and on the ground. So how we posture to do that, we got to figure it out. It's hard, I know, but again, if we can get leader commitment behind this and have us being able to articulate this desire based on the third thing I'm going to, I'm going to give you, and that is, that is data and metrics. I think we need a lot more data to convince our leaders that we need the infrastructure to write a strategy that they're going to be committed to and they're going to follow. You've got to have data. I remember, I remember uh, a past uh, USD PNR who came from the Air Force as an MNRA, Mike Dominguez, who now works at IDA. I remember Mike asking me one day uh, when he was in the, in the PNR job, he said, CJ, I was at Corona. And uh, I had the first time general was talking about how we were going to advance diversity in the Air Force. This is in the 2008-9 time frame. And he said, general asked me a question that I wasn't sure how to answer. I said, what was the question, sir? He said, tell me why I need a Hispanic flag an airplane. Tell me why I need a Hispanic, a person who had to be Hispanic to fly his airplane. And I wish I had some something to tell him. I said, sir, I could have offered a few thoughts, but he said, I just I had him right there. My point is, as we push data metrics, rationale behind data metrics, uh, I think that we have a more convincing story, if you will, to tell, to articulate to our bosses how we need to have a strategy and an infrastructure to support that strategy because this data supports that. We've got to know what the data says, what it means. We're going to work more with, and I'm glad that Sam Dan is still here, we're going to work more with OPA the Office of People Analytics to try to put into some of the surveys that go across the department, what kinds of divert, we've already started working this with, with Diomi, and from the, and DIOX 4.1 does have some employee engagement kinds of questions in it. We're gonna work with, and, but, but DIOX doesn't give us that weighted, that scientific evidence, it gives more of a snapshot of what's happening in a particular unit, but we need more evidence across the force, so we're gonna, my staff is gonna work with OPA to put more questions in to kind of get to how do we a frame this whole thing in diversity and inclusion so that we can use that frame uh, to, 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 to mitigate some of the behavior in the name of diversity and inclusion. So that's the thing we're going to try to work to. And I encourage all of you to work together as best as you can to see how you can build strategies that will get a leader committed to an infrastructure that you need proven by metrics that you find. So in closing, we're on a journey. I believe that uh, and you believe, I know, that equality and inclusion are values that make the department great. And as MEO, EEO, and DNI professionals, at whatever level you are, you are the leaders, you're the ones on the ground to, and in the headquarters to make it, make it all happen. At your level, you are the one to articulate the needs, to draft the strategies, to express yourself to the senior leaders, to come up with the solutions for your particular level where you are. You are indeed the architects of the future of DNI. And as you prepare to leave this collaborative series and head back to your respective offices, think about what DNI advances you want to see in your organization. I truly believe that together we can advance DNI across the department today for a stronger total force tomorrow. This is indeed a challenge. This is indeed a challenge, I understand that, but I think that if we work together, work collaboratively, as I will continue to do, I'm so blessed to be able to work with folks like Sean Jones, Victoria Bourne, Dr. Herbin, others across the services who really are committed to, to DNI, and we will continue to do that. This ends my presentation, I'll bar any questions. Any questions of me, please? Yes, sir, Mr. Dr. Driscoll. Kevin Driscoll. Um, years ago, we used to have a, a, a directive that mandated the services um, provide the military equal opportunity assessment. And it hits on all those areas like command positions, promotion rates, occupational skill sets, 
uh, Air Force qualification test scores, Armed Forces qualification test scores, um, school uh, in resident at, uh, PME attendance, all those different factors. And that was mandated and all the services had to turn that in each year. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember working on the, um, on the Air Force one. Mm -hmm. But that requirement went away, but I think when in the past, it was really a, a good tool for leadership because we used to have the chief of staff of the Air Force sign it out. And it's a good way of getting visibility based on some of those um, structural structural barriers that 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 um, hinder people from pro progressing up. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee that coming back anytime soon or maybe change the name of it or change, maybe broaden what it's actually measuring too? I think it's a, somebody, Brock, you planted that question? Okay, okay. <laughs> I say it because Rock is right now. We have a diversity inclusion uh, a, a DOTI, uh, Kevin, that pulls that into that DOTI. Okay. Uh, you're absolutely correct. And I was there when it, quote, went away. It yep. went away because of, I remember going to meetings with the then Assistant Secretary of Defense and the services arguing that this is, this is over, over, they're strong on us. So uh, we backed off of it. We used to, of course, yep. receive those reports, get a contractor to give us an assessment of the services. And we were told to work with the services to develop strategy. So that's what we got, got, we got to where we are now. Right. But I totally agree with you. And we have uh, talked to current leadership about this thing on the idea to put some of that those same measures into DNI policy. Great. Thank you. Good, good question. Absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, exactly. Pulling data from the services, not giving it to them, saying it. Exactly. And, the, and again, the DNI policy is going to be a collaborative effort as we work on it. In fact, Sean is going to be sitting right in the room. Uh, uh, are helping right. We are about, I don't know, maybe a third of the way there. But the idea to publish this fiscal year, that's the idea. I'm going to put it on the, the expedite lane because it's something that is needed in the department. Mr. Yeah. Johnson. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Shirley Copeland, NGB. You didn't mention my name when you talked about the NGB. I'm sorry, I'm JDEC. Okay, <laughs> okay so, so Shirley is the one who does the JDEC. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> quick question. What do we do about, um, I know we're all very sensitive and very careful about the current political environment, but what do we do about those subtle subtleties or those unspoken actions that are re slowly removing diversity from their programs or from their um, priorities? Okay, the, the only, in the in DOD, well, in DOD, yes, sir. They, uh, I've I've heard well, now. This is just rumor, but you know, rumor. There's how much percentage? It's there's a scientific study that proves that rumors come from some sort of truth. That there are certain organizations that are either changing the names from because diversity for a lot of people has a negative connotation. They don't really understand it, and for the most part. Majority of people are still very uncomfortable with dealing with issues of race and ethnicity and gender on LGBT communities and those type of topics. So when it comes, comes there's an opportunity where we, we know the leadership, we have leadership support from the SECDEF on down. But there's the middle, what I refer to as the, the frozen middle that we run into oftentimes that create sometimes roadblocks to success in diversity or to implementation of diversity plans. And when given an opportunity to either halt or reverse or just not engage, they will take the, that road, you said we have many miles to go, they will take the road that leads them down the disengagement. How do we as diversity professionals continue to be motivated and to move through that type of consternation? With policy, uh, I have no, the only, you, you, you frame your question with, with uh, diversity, something being redone or renamed or re something. Uh, I'm not aware, the only thing I'm aware of uh, is, you know, when, when, uh, when uh, the Attorney General uh, wrote uh, and am amicus brief to the court uh, indicating that uh, this administration would not uh, 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 would not uh, uh, process um, LGBT 
uh, issues in federal court. Uh, and that came pretty clear when the administration. Yes, uh, sir. Well, that, that's the, 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 well, but but see the the EEOC, which is who gives us direct oversight and guidance, is is not doing it. EEOC is still working EEOC issues. Uh, we've asked for any clarification, and the EEOC says to me three times uh, for the last for the last six months that when their uh, chair gets in place, when, which he or she is not, at least it wasn't this last month. Uh, that they will come out with any further guidance they need to come out with. But as of today, and uh, so many of your practitioners, if I'm wrong, please raise your hand. Sir, so go ahead. Oops. This is Dr. Hervey. Yeah, sure, um, sure. I just wanted yeah. to, to make sure that I clarify what she um, was saying because we had conversation outside of okay. session um, that was concerning. Um, there's a perception, and I think we've talked about it during the That's conference right. or the collaborative. Let me not say the other C word during the collaborative mm -hmm. that um, we can interchange diversity and inclusion. And so since we can interchange it, we can drop diversity out of our vocabulary totally. And I think Ms. Shirley, if you can correct me if I'm wrong, there is perception that diversity and inclusion mean the same thing, but it, the, the, the word diversity is so touchy to some people instead of addressing it, they just want to take it out. And there have been conversations in our working groups and our okay. teleconferences for the Army specifically that spoke to that. So she may be alluding to a little bit of that, but what I will say is we have to continue to provide awareness and education. And I've gotten at least some more since I've been here. Diversity and inclusion is not the same. And I think someone else said you can't be inclusive if you don't have the environment that's already diverse. So it's not the same thing. If yeah. that helps. Well, you know, and, well, and, not, I'm sorry. Th thank you, Dr. Herbie. But not only that, Mr. Johnson, it's just that there is a subtle undertone that we don't address in the Department of Defense because, because of the nature of the Department of Defense, and that's what the service is as well. And I just want to make sure this should be an opportunity for diversity and inclusion professionals to be able to speak openly and candidly about the day-to-day -day issues that we're dealing with. For example, in the Navy, when I was with the Navy, you could talk about leadership support from General Muddle on down. But when you get to the deck plate, when you get to those people out at sea on the ships, people on the submarines, the submarine corps was not diverse. When you get talked to the women on the, uh, uh, on the ships, the women on the ships did not get promoted. The women on the ships dealt with sexual harassment every single day. And those are the kind of things where with the soldiers in the battalions, with the females out in the field. These are the little things that I'm not sure that senior leadership or the, the frozen middle, they just want the job done. They, they say they don't care what you look like as long as you can do the job. That's all I need, somebody to do the job. So those are the kind of issues that we are realistically dealing with that we don't realistically verbalize and talk about. Well, so, I, I don't. So that, I, that's my concern. Okay, I don't, subtleties. I don't. I don't. I, don't I have no idea what you mean by subtleties, uh, uh, Ms. Copeland. But I will tell you, uh, this, this department uh, makes every effort, I believe, to try to understand what's happening in the force. Uh, again, the number of survey tools that go out and ask folks to express uh, the issues of the workplace equal opportunity survey, acting reserve component, the workplace gender relations survey, acting component, the status of forces survey. And the, the services got their own surveys too, trying to assess what's going on. There's DOX uh, surveys. So hopefully, whatever you're describing in a particular unit is raised to some level of, of, of leadership and authority. Uh, and that leadership and authority uh, person takes care of it. I, the reason why I asked the lady the question yesterday, how would she deal with this? And I didn't probably didn't phrase my question the best way. Uh, but I was trying to ask her, my, and, and Mr. Fraz kind of helped me with. With this question, but what I was trying with this answer, this question, what I was trying to ask her was, when you face not folks who are toxic, the system gonna take care of them. But when you face that silhouette, as she called it yesterday, uh, uh, how do you, as a practitioner, deal with that person? Because they may, because of their passiveness, because of their uh, belief that we can't talk about these issues around the leader. Uh, we can't talk about this even in the cafeteria if it's two of us. And we are heard, two of us overheard, overheard talking about these issues. We get, you know, called out and beat upside the head. Uh, so, so how do we deal with those? That's the reason why I asked that question. I will submit to you, though, 
that we at every level need to be articulating issues and concerns to our leadership, to our direct leadership. And uh, the, the reality is the reality is, you know, if you talk about, you know, your, your question kind of alludes to maybe some sort of a, uh, I don't know, right wing something that's going on in, in DOD that left wing would, uh, would be against. Uh, I don't know that if that's the case, that's the case. You know, we are apolitical. I'm, we all supposed to be apolitical, but we again we come from the the, the, the society, and society folks have different political leanings. They're not supposed to show up in, 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 in a setting where there's military and civilian workforce, but sometimes they do, and when they do, we deal with it. I mean, that's just the idea. It's, but we have policies that uh, uh, are in place to follow, and and we at every leadership level got to make sure those policies are followed. I don't know. The solo kind of stuff, uh, anecdotally, I, I, I haven't heard that, and I haven't seen it in a survey device, so it may be something kind of in a particular unit that you heard, but that unit needs to deal with it if it comes out. Any, anyone else want to, I mean, other service leaders you want to address that? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. I think this is a great conversation. Um, having, you've been doing it longer than I have, and, and I've been doing this since uh, 2010. Um, I think one of the things that the type of person who is working diversity and inclusion has to be one of thick skin and have to be very, very strategic. Um, because when we talk about the silhouette, um, and I'll just talk about from the standpoint of me being within the Department of Navy and having five bosses in a matter of four years, each one of them were different. Some were very engaged and some were not so engaged. And I think we as practitioners have to figure out how do we strategize when we, we need to understand to, uh, to support a leader where that person is. That's exactly right. Um, what we can't be is forcing something where an organization is not ready to go, but leverage the analytics and the data that tells the story. Mm -hmm. So if we are not great individuals of understanding analytics and predicting what we think is occurring um, in there, we just can't come up with anecdotal um, points of view. So, so the key, I think, particularly in an environment where, you know, just like any other senior leader, when you get new leadership, things change. And so when they change, so must we. And, and not necessarily change the way we do things, but change how we go about doing that. And the biggest challenge that I think for, as far as diversity and inclusion is, is that when I hear the story, it takes 30 years to grow someone to be a senior leader, then the question I would ask is, are you paying attention to the right thing? That's already given, so I don't need to keep talking about it takes 30 years. What I need to focus on are those things that are really have a significant impact. What are those major predictors? And, and Mr. Fraz, you make a great point as far as pushing the information down, and part of that pushing the information down, the reason we have to do that is because I think we don't necessarily, I'm just talking from the Department of Navy because I'm growing individuals, is that are we prepared and postured to push things up when we know that there is an issue? And I would say the great thing that's happened within the Department of Navy, me being at the secretariat level, is that I provide that leverage to bring those things up through a council where they don't necessarily get pushed up at the next level. Yeah. So building those relationships with the key stakeholders within your services, like your MEO and your D, the folks who work DNI and the EEO individuals and your legal personnel and your public affairs, those individuals are key so that you can get a great, you can get a, a, a um, a broader perspective on a bunch of things and figure out a way, how do you connect the dots that says there seems to appear to be trends and it's not just one data point, it's multiple data points. And so I think that's where, regardless of what happens on leadership, political, whatever it may be, is that we maintain our strategic view on things and we become that strategic advisor to our senior leaders. Exactly. You know, I, uh, I, I don't wanna talk to this group like I'm talking to EOAs, but uh, I get a chance to, when these kids come in for training, I get a chance to talk to them quite often. And let me just tell you, again, I'm not talking down to anybody, but let me just say, here's what I say to your ways. I said, you're going to be leaving here, this institute, in the next number of weeks or days or whatever. And the most important thing you will need to do, EOA, young E7, Army First Sergeant, who just came out of recruiting battalion, and now you're going to be doing EO work, is you need to engage your direct boss and get some trust in him or her. They need to know that you are there to support them, you're there to take care of their program, and here's what you bring to them to take care of their program. That's number one. The next second thing you need to do is develop allies. 
You need to know who the allies are in your particular unit who care about what you care about, who can help you, whether they are folks who work in HR, whether they are folks who work in safety, well, whoever they are, uh, to get it, develop allies. I will say this to you, she mentioned your bosses. I'm personally on my 15th boss in 15 years. Fifth, I've had 15 direct reports in the 15 years I've been in this job. And, and I will tell you, sometimes it takes you know, longer time than others to have your bosses trust, have your boss understand and believe in what you do. I'm fortunate the boss I got right now, who herself, I don't think she mind me telling you this, her background is social work. Uh, she's worked in communities as a school teacher. She has worked in Boston, uh, bringing in kids from disparate backgrounds and poor backgrounds and trying to train them to be all they can be. So she understands this. I mean, she's very data conscious and very research conscious, obviously. But she understands this. That's not an issue I had to deal with her. But you need to, if your boss does not understand what you do, it's on you to explain it to him or her. And it may take time, it may take data, it may take whatever your boss wants, you go do it. I would strongly encourage that because the boss is the one you gotta work for. And, so, and I would so, say, sir, ahead, that sir. is where the disconnect is. Mm -hmm. um, as EO practitioners, or those EOAs that are out there, mm -hmm. they work for that commander, mm -hmm. that leader. Mm -hmm. So if that commander or leader doesn't value EEO mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. EO, mm -hmm. then they, that person, that EO practitioner, won't feel valued. Mm -hmm. And so that practitioner, which although they come through Diomi, and, and Diomi mm -hmm. is a great uh, institute here, but if they're not trained in that short of time, they're not trained to really be change agents out there in the field. Because we, we have not equipped them and fully developed them to be change agents. Especially when we talk about EO uh, uh, advisors and program managers out there, probably half of them don't want to even do the job from the start. And, and if you look at, I, I don't recall him, I, I believe his name was Mr. Jenkins. He was a senior um, um, e, 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 EO advisor. He was a senior EO advisor, and he did not change or see himself until he came here to the institution. Mm -hmm. So these are senior leaders out there right now in these leadership uh, positions that have not come to Diomi to be, take part of LTAS to see themselves. They have not identified their own bias. Uh, they have not identified uh, things that, um, or even accepted diversity. And, and so the key element is not the EO practitioners. The key element is the commander, those leaders that are out there. Well, that I, is the individual. So the bridge from diversity to inclusion, the commander is that bridge. The support is the EEO and EO practitioners. That's the way I see it. Well, I will submit to you that, that if we, that as we, thank you very much for that very uh, persuasive discussion. But I will submit to you that one of the reasons why we conducted DOX and one reason why the DOX, uh, the, 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 the Secretary of Defense said in 2014, I believe, he said, you commanders taking DOX instruments, you have to give your, your, your results to your boss. If in fact, if in fact, the, uh, if in fact the DOX instrument does not relate to the commander, what his or her shortcomings are, then maybe we need to continue to evolve the DOX. The DOX is a good tool. The DOX is a good tool. Who said something? Yeah. Deox is a good tool. Right. The problem is, again, the old practitioners mm -hmm. do not know how to interpret that data. They don't know how to codify it. And when it comes to presenting it to the commander, one, it, they don't present it in a manner that is where the commander can understand it. And, and then that commander really doesn't want to see himself. Okay. And, and, and again, that information, guess who see that information? The commander is the only one that sees that information. And so if that commander squelched that practitioner, we're not going to have inclusion. It, whether you look at it from discriminatory illegal practices out there or just uh, harassment, bullying, or whatever the case may be, or discrimination, uh, legal discrimination, if you will, especially because I don't like those Cowboys fans out there. <laughs> but those are... But but those are type of things that hey I these individuals are not Cowboys fans these individuals are so when I get ready for to put my project together I want all my non Cowboys fan on my team now these people don't feel valued and so that information through the DOX is identified mm -hmm. but is not conveyed to that commander 
and no one else sees it, even if it is conveyed to the commander. So, so, so when individuals take your DI, they don't say that, what you just saying. I'm sorry. Let me tell you what we've done at the Department of Navy, specifically at the <laughs> Navy. Um, <laughs> within the Navy, let me tell you how serious our senior leadership has taken this, and I got a Navy person in the back. The, the climate assessment, not necessarily specifically the climate assessment, that is part of the performance appraisal. The military performance appraisal, when I say appraisal, performance report, has that piece on there that says climate. And they, they are being graded and measured based upon the results of the deox that rolls up. So it's not just a document that stops with the commander. It, of course, it's rolled up to the higher commander, but we have codified it in the actual performance report. Thank you. But uh, Dr. Bolden, I hope you took, uh, I know you have a device where you assess commanders who you sent EOAs to. I know that the process by which in the last time I saw it, I think some 90 some percent of commanders told you that uh, they were, you were training your, their EOAs effectively. Uh, this gentleman, the other, must be another 5%. Uh, so, so, so I encourage you to maybe sidebar and uh, figure out what we can do better with EOAs. I will tell you again, though, we are right now in the throes of better equipping EOAs because EOAs now who deal with the behavior they've been trained for, and they're going to get more to deal with. Uh, and if they're not EOAs, there may be something else you call them, CCSs for the Navy, or maybe in dealing with these, these, uh, these late problematic behaviors, maybe the services will have other folks who will need to come to the Army to get training as well. But we have a system, uh, we do surveys, we ask individuals to tell us what's going on. In the EO surveys, folks folk need to say that at high enough rate as you just say it, and, uh, and we'll adjust. Uh, but the point is, the DOX is a tool, the EOA is a train, and if, uh, we got one data point at least that says that uh, we need more EO training and better EO training, so let's keep working. Sir, I just wanted to say a few things, and I hope it doesn't sound like rambling. I'm gonna try to get it out in less than three minutes. Oh, God. So Somebody said, oh God, oh my God, somebody that bad. So um, I just wanted to address my brother that got up. He was so spirited, I don't know your name. What's your name? Matthew, Matthew. okay. So you said a lot of things that were important and a lot of what you were saying is what we were talking about uh, right before or right after um, we were dismissed for lunch. It was a whole crew of people around me. I turned around and it, I had a whole circle. I mean, I was circled. They literally circled me in, okay? Somebody should have taken a picture. Yeah. Test, 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 so, test. yeah, they really did. So, what I wanted to say was there's a couple of factors at bay based off of what you said. I went through Diomi. I'm not going to say that when I left Diomi, I was absolutely prepared for everything that I needed to do for the unit because I didn't know the culture of the unit that I was going to. I was not in it yet. So I'm not going to counter you and say that Diomi didn't prepare me or it doesn't prepare its practitioners. Each person that comes through this school has a different personality. We're not cloned. So I understand what you're saying because everybody that circled me were, were from tactical units. I had no one over there standing there that were from the Pentagon. They were like, we in Georgia panel, but it was all up here. It didn't apply to us. So I had to take another 30 minutes to take the time to, to um, what is it, connect what I was talking about with how it was important to them. They want to know how do I do it in spite of. We already know that some commanders are not buying in. We know that. How do you get the buy-in? You have to be creative. Mr. CJ, Mr. Johnson used the word strategic. I used the word creative. We have to be creative because guess what else? We ain't getting no more money. And we ain't getting no more people. So if we take the time to send people through uh, Diomi, at least take what you can take and then be creative. Find your allies, which I did. Mine was the chief of staff. We have, to, we have to reach the commanders where they are. Yes, a lot of people do not value, when I'm talking about people, I'm talking about leaders. They don't value EO for reasons I said earlier. They think we're glorified party planners. Yes, I said it because somebody said it to me in the Pentagon and I had to keep my, my tact because I was, you know, I'm in my fancy clothes. No, I was not a glorified party planner. I was the eyes, ears, and somebody else in here said, we want to add the word conscious to the regulation. The eyes and the ears of the commander. We are the climate folks. Somebody else said in the circle, 
I think the Navy got it right or the Marines got it right. They completely changed the name. That may be an option for the Army. Instead of being EO advisors, we can change it to make it climate advisors. Now, I'm not the decision maker, but I can push the agenda. Maybe that will change how we perform. But until it happens, like I said to somebody in the uh, circle, they said, well, all we need to do is put it in regulation. So you're telling me that when you put it in the regulation, it's going to change every character of every leader in the Army the next day. We know that's not true. It's good to codify. But it's also good to understand that in the meantime, we have got to be creative and strategic. Thanks. And, and wh where are you from again, by the way? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm Ar gonna... Army Reserve EEO office, Fort McCoy, Wisconsin. So, so you, are in, you work in the Army Reserve EEO office? Yes, sir. And, okay. and I'm a prior EEO program manager as well, so 8th so Army. Your, your perspective is from your time now in, in uh, both? or Both EEO as well as EEO. How long and, were you an EEO officer, a EEO person? Uh, for over two and a half years. No, how long ago? I'm how long ago? Uh, a little over four, five years ago. Okay. First of all, I, I have an issue with anyone say that EO program managers have to, or advisors have to have the commander's buy-in. This is a EO, uh, this is a commander's program. And so my whole point in saying all this, it's not about the EO and it's not about the institution that we have here. It's the institution to train our leaders to be um, inclusive. This is a leadership issue. This is not an EO issue. The, and, I don't disagree so with, I don't I, with that. I'll okay. just leave it at that because I can I can go on for a little bit here. Well, but, uh, well in fact, in fact, uh, yeah, training about of all, at all levels of leadership. Is and important, the question so. is, where in what institutional training is happening as far as uh, 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 for the commanders to identify and become more aware? LTAS is great. Those lead, we need to be in LTAS or at least out there in the, all of these courses. We don't have that type of training out there. Well, again, uh, one, of the, one of the tasks from the, the most recent DOTI is that uh, we will begin to review, and I, will, and I will tell you, the services have been trending in, in, in EO and MEO and all that for some years. I won't speak for the services, but uh, I came from the Air Force, and certainly the Air Force trained me in EO, uh, and that was almost 20 years ago. So, okay, one more time, one more question. One Ms. More question. Mr. Johnson, and I keep I getting the, the, the time hack here. Okay, one more Excuse question. Excuse me, I wanted to address the, uh, the gentleman before me. The military culture a lot of times, and we don't want to talk about this either, either, the EOAs are enlisted and their commanders or officers. A lot of times those officers just don't want to take advice from an enlisted person. And that's, I mean, take it or leave it. That's the reality of the culture. Well, I tell you what, I, you know, I, I grew up as an officer and, and in officer school I learned that that uh, officers own the, own the system and EO and enlisted run it. So part of the running in my organization, I tr trust them very heavily in my enlisted force. So, okay, this has been uh, good. <laughs> so what I, what I take away from this, time's up, okay. Uh, what, what do I take away from this? I take away that, uh, that uh, we have more work to do, that we are passionate, passionate people doing this, obviously. Uh, but there's research that needs to be done, there's planning that needs to be done, there's training that needs to be done, and uh, we take it seriously. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Uh, let me now turn the floor over to, thank you. Now, are we going, are we going to break or go right into Mr. Griffith? We're going to take a break. Well, let's, let's talk to the audience. You all want to take a break now for 10 minutes? Okay, five minute break, five minute break.